Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, the Transboundary Haze Pollution in Southeast Asia, Effect and uh, Forest Fire Management in Indonesia webinar. I am very pleased to welcome you to this uh, webinar. And uh, my name is Adrian Sasonko. Uh, I'm RDS Program Manager. And I'm uh, very happy to be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, I hope everyone is in a healthy condition where, wherever you are. Although the pandemic has forced us to hold this event virtually, I hope everyone still has the highest enthusiasm to learn together with us through this webinar. I hope we can have a lively and fruitful discussion along the process. It is hoped that through this webinar, there will be lessons learned that we can get for strategic actions to increase the capacity and quality of forest fires, disaster risk management in Indonesia. And therefore, the flow of today's webinar will be divided into two main parts. Uh, the first part would be, will be a presentation by our keynote speakers and uh, followed by uh, feedback from our discussants. Then a short Q&A session We'll, with the audience will also be conducted near the end of our webinar today. I'm also very pleased to welcome our honorable keynote speakers today. Uh, the first, we already have uh, Dr. Emmanuel Seclifes uh, from uh, 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 Lancaster University. And uh, we also have uh, Professor Dr. Bambang Heru Saharjo uh, from Faculty of Forestry, Bogor Agricultural University, IPB. And we also have uh, Dr. Helena Binti Muhammad Faki from uh, Department of International and Strategic Studies, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya. And honorable discussants, we have Dr. Arif Vijaya from World Resource Institute Indonesia, and uh, Dr. Insinyur Lailan Shaufina, MSK from Faculty of Forestry, Bogor Agricultural University. Thank you so much for, we, for willing to share and have a discussion with us today in this webinar. Before we get started, I would like to remind all attendees to fill the attendance form, which can be accessed uh, in the chat uh, uh, from RDA team. We will uh, share the link on the chat. And uh, I would like also to uh, explain several things to ensure that our webinar today runs smoothly. Maybe uh, uh, from RDA team can share uh, the rules. Oh, the English version maybe. So uh, the rules, these are, these are the rules. Uh, the first is please log in as guest with your full name, strip institution or affiliation. And uh, participants, uh, please fill the attendance list at the below link. Uh, provided in the chat box and the YouTube live chat. And during the webinar, please turn off the panelist microphone and activate the panelist video if possible. And the fourth is uh, participants are not allowed to turn on the microphone and video during the webinar. We, ha we have unactivated the chat room feature in Zoom. So please write down your questions in Padlet through the below link provided in the chat box and uh, YouTube live chat. And the selected questions will be addressed in the Q&A session and discussion session. And then the panelist presentation materials will be available at the link that provided uh, below. And uh, lastly, we record the meeting and uh, save the presentation. So uh, the, the meeting, uh, the, the, the webinar will be uh, recorded and uh, Later, we will also share uh, the recording through the YouTube channel. Now, uh, it is time for the opening speech from RDI's Executive Director, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Rianawati. To Bu Elizabeth, time is yours. Thank you very much, Adrian, and welcome you all to our webinar. Uh, RDI is the one who coordinating this webinar, but actually this is a collaborative project uh, under Humane, 
uh, that is uh, coordinated by uh, Dr. Emmanuel Sekalev from Lancaster University. So uh, this is uh, hopefully just a beginning of a further collaboration and communication between uh, the partners in this uh, project. I would like also to take up your time a little bit to introduce a little bit on uh, RDI. So we are a think tank uh, based in Indonesia. And then, um, yeah, we can go next, please. Okay, this is just some of our uh, research location that we have conducted as well as our partners of research. Next, please. And we have a several research cluster in RDI. And uh, for this uh, humane uh, project, uh, it is under disaster and climate resilience. So um, I myself is very eager to uh, continue uh, with this uh, webinar, uh, especially with the topic because we, as Ardian has mentioned before, we have our distinguished speaker and also panelists, Professor Bambang, uh, Dr. Varki, and Emmanuel Sekala for Arif. So yes, uh, please enjoy our webinar and do not hesitate to contact us, any of us in this, uh, in this uh, webinar and hopefully there will be a collaboration soon. Thank you, Adrian, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, who acted as uh, director of RDI. For the next session, we will have a Menti quiz session. Uh, so I would like to give a little warm up for us today regarding forest fire. There is no right or wrong answer. So please feel free to answer it according to your opinions or experiences. Okay, if you're ready, please open menti.com in your devices browser and enter the voting code. Uh, the voting code is uh, 21393757 as the code. Our committee has also shared the link on the chat box if you would like to join directly through the link. So right now we have eight answers. And now we have uh, around 40 participants. So maybe uh, we can wait a little long, bit longer to wait for others to join the Mentimeter quiz. So the first question is, have you ever experienced haze pollution from the impact of forest fire? And many, uh, majority of uh, our participants um, answered no. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are some significant uh, number of uh, participants that answered yes. Okay, maybe next to the next question. Do you think that forest fires could directly or indirectly affect climate change? Give us some example. Maybe can, we can wait for more participants to join. It's only uh, to answer right now. We are we, ha we already have some answers and uh, 
some of them are air pollution and also human health um, and also um, flooding and there is also reducing green coverage biodiversity loss drier forest uh, condition and also water cycle disruption GHG emissions. Interestingly, also uh, some answer uh, drought and also uh, economic loss. Maybe we can next to the next uh, question. What do you think is the biggest challenge in forest fire management? Palm oil industry, human settlement, policy. Implementing the policies and also industries, state cooperation, finance, politics, states cooperation, law enforcement. Complicated bureaucracy that is also maybe connected to the law enforcement and also the government points, ecosystem damage, and also the prediction when the fire happens. Also, there is a uh, state cooperation. Very interesting answers. Maybe uh, we can go to the next uh, question if there is any. Okay, so that was uh, our Mentimeter session. Okay, thank you for answering the question. And um, I hope uh, through this small quiz, uh, we can uh, get through some of the ideas about uh, uh, the issues behind the forest fire in Indonesia. And also maybe uh, it, uh, we can also uh, going to the next session, which is uh, 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 we, can, we are going to uh, uh, talk about uh, what is uh, the project of the human uh, project and which is a part of the continuity collaborative research between RDI with uh, Lancaster University uh, and University of Malaya and also University Kebangsaan Malaysia. And uh, before uh, we continue, uh, we also would like to thank the institutions who supported the implementation of this webinar. Uh, especially uh, to uh, World Research Institute Indonesia, where Indonesia and also Bogor Agricultural University ATB. Okay, um, now we will begin the session that everyone has been waiting for. I am very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Seclifis. Uh, he is the co-director of a Future Cities Research Institute also a senior uh, lecturer at Lancaster, Lancaster University. His main research uh, interests are in designing and co-designing interactions, experiences, tools, and games that inform and influence behavior change, promote a better uh, society, and facilitate health and well-being. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel uh, today will give us a little bit of introduction to the original idea on the humane uh, project or concept in general. The human project itself uh, will look closer at 
the concentrate and decentralized forest management in Indonesia and how along with the slow onset hazards of climate change, they contribute to inequities in distribution of benefits from uh, forest resources. Um, while listening to Dr. Emmanuel's presentation, uh, participants who would like to ask questions to Dr. Emmanuel can write down uh, the questions on the link that has been provided by our committee on the chat box. Please write uh, to whom you your question is directed to and along with your brief, brief identity. Um, Dr. Emmanuel, you have uh, 15 minutes for your presentation, time is yours. Yeah, Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and thanks again the, uh, the organizers, IDI, along with the par partners for organizing um, today's very topical and much needed event. And, and I'm pleased to be among uh, like-minded colleagues uh, from different uh, parts of the world. Um, so good day to everyone. Um, to talk about something that I believe we, we all have a stake, um, looking at ways of addressing transboundary haze pollution in Southeast Asia. And I'm going to talk how uh, in the Humane Project we propose to do that via community engagement in Indonesia. And I'm going to do that by talking about the five W's, the what, the why, the how, the who and the when. So I'm going to make a start with the, uh, the what. And um, I mean, we, we all know that the concentrated forest management in Indonesia, along with climate change, as mentioned before, and inequitable distribution of benefits from forest resources has actually led to increasing conflict between communities that depend from forests, but also corporate companies, and sometimes the central and local government. And of course, this conflict is in turn leading to an unprecedented increase in forest fires. And the haze that results from these wildfires is creating regional spillovers as it is transported by strong winds to neighboring countries such as Singapore and Malaysia, impacting public health, education of um, cross-border communities and, and often causing transnational conflict um, as well. So I think the most important question is, you know, the why, why is this happening? Um, there's several reasons. Um, I mean, we know, and it was clear by some of the responses provided uh, by participants in the Mentimeter um, survey beforehand, that forest fires are mainly induced by humans, by anthropogenic activities. And of course, they're exaggerated by climate change. And, and of course, this is relating to several actors, several different stakeholders having interest in land and forest fires, either preventing, overcoming, or seeking benefits from them. And more precisely, balancing the rapid urbanization with forest management uh, is a challenge. And it's a challenge we face everywhere in the world, not just in Indonesia. And due to limited availability of space, you know, the trend of clearing forests to make way for yeah. cultivatable yeah. land has been gaining popularity. And this often leads to an increasing amount of forestry and social conflict. Um, and of course, forest fires um, due to land preparation from palm oil and timber plantation, not just by companies, but also by small farm holders. Um, and of course, this large-scale deforestation, uh, we know that can alter regional weather, even local climate. Um, and Indonesia, in fact, ranks, ranks highest in carbon dioxide emissions from petland degradation. And I'm sure colleagues, when they talk about petland fires, they're going to mention that. And basically what this means is that this makes forest even drier and therefore more susceptible to fire and more difficult than to extinguishing such fires. Of course, all these lead to environmental, health, educational, and broad economic issues and deprivation for communities that are affected by that. And of course, such social conflict results often in increasing violence and, and deaths of vulnerable people. As uh, in most cases, children, they tend to bear the brunt of this. Uh, they're more fragile and are affected the most um, as the health is threatened 
Actually, it's estimated that around 10 million children are at risk from air pollution as a result of fires. I mean, 10 million is basically the size of um, Jakarta population. So imagine that. And of course, the learning process is disrupted for long periods due to illness, but also school closures. And in 2019 alone, there have been over two and a half thousand schools that closed in Indonesia and another two thousand and a half schools that closed with in Malaysia, impacting children across the region, uh, of course, in terms of their education. So I guess the important thing is, you know, how, right, how do we resolve that? What can we do? Um, what is clear is that following the same uh, approaches we've been following before um, is not necessarily resolving the situation. Uh, in fact, the top-down approach um, that has been adopted uh, seems that um, it has um, limited outcomes, although there may be some pockets of success. And in fact, um, unless we, we change the way we do things, unless we have a paradigm shift, what we'll be doing is what you see in, uh, in my slide here, you know, trying to put out um, a large wildfire with a bucket, you know, is not going to do it. Um, and the three points that I would like to make here about, you know, how we can resolve that, and that relates to the humane project proposal. Now, first of all, preventing fires and conflict, and as a result, transboundary haze requires, first of all, identifying, you know, what are the key drivers of fragility? in order to strengthen the factors of resilience. And this is not limited just to the drivers of conflict, but encompasses several different intersectional risks, um, such as climate change, uh, economic, social health, um, and political uh, systems as well. Um, according to the World Bank Group, as prevention is about creating uh, incentives for actors to choose actions that resolve conflict without violence, it is important to identify the forest management conflict drivers and the intersectional risks. However, we know from the literature that systematic evidence of the presence of local conflict, the underlying factors associated with it and the impact upon communities is limited and understudied. And therefore, this is my first point, you know, we need to discover, first of all, the key drivers from the different stakeholder groups perspective and um, across different sectors in order to, uh, to be able to deal with forest management conflict, uh, but also understand better the impact on different communities. Um, secondly, the best way to prevent societies from descending into crisis and conflict is to ensure that they're resilient through investment in both inclusive but also sustainable development. Uh, studies by the World uh, Bank Group have actually demonstrated that prevention works and it's cost effective, with many countries having actually successfully managed high risk conflicts and avoided descending into violence. And building a community's resilience and uh, protecting natural resources is therefore an important component of community engagement um, in this context. So what we need is participation of local communities um, as this approach will help increase community resilience in order to mitigate forest uh, management conflict. Um, and this is true because you know, perception of environmental risk and mitigation decisions are often affected by how the larger community sees the risks. For instance, other than inducing forest fires, local communities along with other stakeholders could actually be involved in mitigating and even preventing them. And therefore building community resilience is, is very key. And this is the second point that, you know, there is an urgent need to develop community preventative um, and resilience measures on forest management conflict and community awareness and preparedness as a result for that. And you might ask, well, how, how do we do that? Well, in addressing this, uh, what we propose in the Humane Project is a community-based approach around forest management and forest fire conflict and haze, one that combines co-design and community engagement. This community-based approach to conflict resolution will anticipate the human drivers and threats behind potential emerging conflict in such context, context 
therefore informing preventative measures uh, before these conflicts emerge. Uh, it is true that uh, differences among people's perceptions and living experiences can often form grounds for conflict uh, to arise and develop. And co-design is a recognized approach uh, to include people in decision-making processes that affect their lives. So rather than uh, just uh, become spectators, actually they can be involved in the process. And a co-design approach to forest management can in fact avoid um, the emergence of conflicts and mitigate hazards by understanding beforehand the motivations that can result in conflict. Therefore, by taking into account people's perceptions and experiences in the various communities, the different stakeholder groups, uh, such an approach can lead to an inclusive and sustainable forest management policy development, shifting forest management focus and approaches right back to people. Um, and for that, we'll need to involve target stakeholders and communities, not merely as research subjects, uh, but also as co-researchers and, and being very much uh, involved um, in the development of interventions, as I mentioned before, of policies as well. Um, the question now is who? And, and of course, we're dealing with um, a, um, a challenge that, as we've seen before, is quite international um, because it affects the whole region. And of course, international collaboration can foster and strengthen knowledge exchange and sharing of best practices, uh, thereby promoting positive learning amongst uh, different stakeholders and neighboring countries can actually become allies when they focus on solving shared challenges. And this is exactly what we proposed in this project, um, a collaboration between um, um, different um, experts uh, from uh, Indonesia, um, Malaysia uh, and the UK sharing the best practices. And, and because, of course, we're dealing with a wicked problem, one that, as we said, has um, challenges in different sectors. Um, what um, we need is basically expertise from very different fields. Um, and you can see that probably reflecting in the slides here. We've got experts in uh, design research, community engagement, international relations, environmental management, policy development, uh, atmospheric and air pollution. And in fact, um, some of my colleagues, uh, you, you've already seen Elizabeth uh, making the, uh, the opening and, and um, Elena, uh, is going to talk uh, later in more detail about some of these aspects. Um, so, so far, uh, basically, I've, um, I've presented an approach with, with three main elements. First of all, we need to understand the intersectional key drivers, uh, and we need to evidence this. Um, then we need to um, engage um, communities in building capacity in terms of their resilience, preparedness, and awareness on forest management. And the way we propose of doing that is through co-design and community engagement. So the natural thing to ask is, you know, when, when is the best time to do that? And for that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use a, an, an old Chinese proverb um, that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Uh, the second best time is now. And I think we're the, at this stage um, with this challenge we're facing, you know, we need to act now uh, as soon as possible. And I'm pleased um, to be talking here to you today because I'm really hoping that we can use today's event as a springboard to enhance the collaboration and really kickstart um, some of this um, activity um, that can make a, a difference, uh, not only to Indonesia, but also the region and be used also as an example uh, for forest management to other parts of the world uh, that face similar challenges. So, this is it uh, from me. I really want to thank everyone um, for, for your attention. And um, I really look forward, um, in fact, to um, meeting uh, people in person when the international flight restrictions end. Um, thanks again. And um, I'm going to stop sh sharing and um, actually uh, pass the floor back to um, um, Adrian. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, for the very insightful presentation. There are several key points that uh, I can catch uh, actually from Dr. Emmanuel's presentation in, the import, in addressing transboundary haze pollution in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's also important to also engage the community 
and also understanding how the conflict is happening and how the forest fire also impacted the education, economics, and social aspects. But the most important is also understanding how to solve the problem. I'm not only solving, but also preventing the forest fire and building resilience to the community in order to mitigate the impact of the forest fire. And also, uh, there is a very uh, interesting uh, point uh, on the combination of uh, co-creation and community engagement that could be a promising approach in the forest uh, management in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, for a very uh, nice presentation from you. And maybe we can next to the next, uh, going to the next uh, keynote speaker uh, for the next presentation. I am very happy to introduce you to our second keynote speaker today, uh, which is Professor Dr. Bambang Herus Harjo. He is a professor in the Department of uh, Civic Culture, Faculty of Forestry, Bogor Agricultural University, who has extensive knowledge and understanding in, on the topic of forest fire, and also one of the most well-known experts whose opinion and analysis have been frequently asked by many people when it comes to forestry and forest fires. Professor Bambang's presentation today is uh, titled uh, Pit Fire versus Greenhouse Gas or GHG Emission and Reduction. And before we begin, I would like to remind you again that if you have any a question while listening to Prof Bambang's uh, presentation, please write it down on the link that has been provided by our community on the chat box. Uh, please write to whom your question is directed to along with your brief identity. Prof. Bambang, uh, you have two and 20 minutes for your presentation. The time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, this, this, today, is this is my third presentation because in the morning I have an international conference and I should spend two minutes there, mostly talking about the, uh, the issue on greenhouse gases. And then we are lucky today because million hectares of fire burn in US, in Europe, Greece, Al Jazeera, Bolivia, Brazil, and I don't remember, million hectares burn already and all produce greenhouse gases. And then we are lucky today because uh, it's, it, there is still fire, but uh, there's still uh, rain everywhere, not, uh, not only in Sumatra, Kalimantan. So, uh, uh, the situation to be like that. So uh, <clears throat> I would like to run my my own uh, PPT because uh, there is a video there. Because if you use the PDF, uh, you cannot uh, see my uh, <clears throat> my uh, video. So I will use my uh, share screen. This is uh, twenty minutes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I think <clears throat> you can see my uh, presentation, right? So uh, uh, this is the, my uh, presentation. Uh, this video is taken by uh, from the uh, space.com. I would like to see you all why I saw this one, because uh, if you calculation on greenhouse gas, especially from PIT, there's the uncertainty. Hopefully after you, you saw this one, maybe this, is, maybe this is part of the solution. I will start with this one. You see here, the fire started and produced smoke here. Yeah? See here? I think we can use uh, in also in ASEAN or maybe other of the world. I think it's necessary. Uh, I think it's better because uh, uh, maybe this way is to reduce the uncertainty, maybe. Yeah?
Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, now we would like to see uh, how about the pit pie? I'll show you the extreme video because uh, this is not uh, often occurs at the uh, uh, or during the pit pile. This is in Jambi. I don't know why it's not good. <clears throat> So this is the, uh, actually this is a video, I don't know, uh, maybe something wrong. Uh, the area is burned for uh, about 2,000 hectares in Jambi, but this is, you know, exim uh, pit uh, or pyres uh, there that uh, sometimes is hard to find other places. This is only one example, yeah. So it is okay. I uh, borrow this video from my college. Yeah? Then uh, last year I went to investigate yeah, for the places. And finally we recognize about uh, 2,000 hectare burns there. Uh, and this one, you see, hopefully there will be no more fire. This project use of the uh, gas house case. Yes. You can see the people around here, they're just watching because they don't know how to do. Because uh, when you calculate the plant temperature here is more than 1000 degrees of Celsius. So it means that if your water drop here, then soon it will be evaporated. So because they use a special, they should have the special treatment, yeah, in order to extinguish or suppress this uh, pit, especially uh, uh, pit pile, okay. And then uh, the the fire, especially on pit that is uh, working on the ground and nobody's care, they don't care because the fire will continue even at night. This is only one example. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the other products will be uh, the smoke. This is, uh, uh, we can see here, we use from wood fuel, NASA. We're working with NASA uh, because we, we, we have, we have uh, <clears throat> research collaboration with several universities at US, led by Professor Mark Cochran at the University of Maryland. Yeah. So uh, this is only an example how we, we monitor the performance of this uh, 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 smoke here, yeah, because it will go there or maybe uh, also come here. So I think this is also a good idea. In in my center, uh, since 2017, we established the, what we call the Regional Fire Management Southeast Asia in collaboration with Max Planck Institute in Germany. So we monitor all this uh, area, especially uh, for the uh, Southeast Asia, it's not only Indonesia, but also others. So we we also have uh, this kind of data. And then, <clears throat> as you know, uh, tropical forests have a pivotal role in uh, buffering the balloon of global environmental change. The forests act as a giant carbon sinks and well preserved tropical forests can reduce global emissions by 30%. Unfortunately, a tropical conservation effort have a significant challenge from the occurrence of fires. And then uh, expand, uh, extensive fire have become more frequent and uh, pervasive in tropical forests worldwide. And also it's been identified that Indonesia is one of the hotspot uh, <clears throat> uh, of the fire activities where, because uh, uh, here we have uh, more than 14 million uh, pit it will come uh, benefit to the country or maybe it will become uh, something, yeah? because if you are uh, not uh, well minutes, there will be problems. And then uh, we know also that fire is a significant source of gas. Yeah? And then process allows amount of uh, small, yeah? for example, 
2.5 billion, etc. And the problem of porous pile cannot be observed merely from a single viewpoint. It must be expansively in various uh, contexts. So when you dealing with uh, smokes there, like you saw from my video, you will look a link with the uh, the accumulation of the greenhouse gases, and then it will impact to the people around, yeah, and also many like and uh, uh, maybe like the previous said, the school stop closed or maybe the transportation. Yeah, I have experience when I would like to go to Spain in 2015 or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I am still, I was still in the ground for investigation. We are lucky because I get, still get the, the flight to go to Jakarta. Uh, otherwise then I, I will, uh, I cannot go to, uh, to uh, Spain for the international conference. So you know, this is become important. But the other person like Pernomo published in 2021, this is not Terry Pernomo from Sipor, but the others Pernomo, they said that there is at least uh, three uh, uh, classification of the actors. So the first maybe, who helps us make an impact in forest fire cases. And then the second one, who have a secondary substantial impact. The third actor are those who pose the, leap, the least influence in the forest fire. This is uh, his uh, uh, research in Kalimantan. Then this is quite interesting. I was in in Madrid, Spain, uh, December 2019, when the Vice President Al Gore stated that they be careful in Indonesia because even your fire is about 1.6 million hectares, but uh, your greenhouse, your emission is nearly 2.6 million burn in 2015. Why? Because uh, your pit is burned there. I communicate also with Mark Perinton from the camps to discuss about this result. From here, you can see yeah, the, how the, the, the producing of this uh, uh, emission day, daily by daily because uh, the area burn is so wide. So this is uh, such kind of warning that if you do nothing or if your activity or your uh, working in this ground is not so uh, optimal, then you will lose your pit and burn and produce huge amount of this uh, emission. And this is in sample before. Yeah? This is this is in 2019 and this is in 2015. Yeah, and nearly this one. And then uh, after we checking about the uh, data in Indonesia, there is clear. Yeah? This is I, I took only seven uh, provinces where where the pit is dominated. For instance, like you can see here. And South Sumatra is more than 64 times burn between 2018 to 2019. It's very huge. And also in central Kalimantan and in Jambi, etc. So the fact that this is true, that this, this is uh, uh, one of the reasons why the increasing of greenhouses is come from peaks. Uh, this is another, yeah, they start from this one, they clear and finally uh, burn. Yeah. So sometimes uh, it's very hard to uh, to detect, yeah? and then sometimes also they collaborate with this this one. Yeah? Uh, this is in 2019. Uh, I was in in Central Kalimantan, yeah, when two months of these areas is burned. Yeah, it's about three thousand hectares. You can see here what you can get. Yeah, because uh, you see here this is woody pit. Yeah, so everybody should know when you come to the site, and finally you will run the activity. You should understand. Body situation. Yeah, it's not because uh, uh, the pit is unique. Do not compare with the mineral soil. This one, for instance, yeah. In Indonesia, we have regulation uh, that you should have managed your blocking canal, canal, yeah. Because, uh, for instance, like a groundwater level should be less than forty centimeters, should be more, etc. Because uh, when you manage this pit land, should be look like at least uh, ecosystem. Because uh, you know, uh, this is a wetland, not dry land. Uh, this is the case, yeah. The other one is when uh, in 2014, it's uh, uh, in, yes, in 2014, I was in, in, in Pompepa, where on the time only is 20,000 hectares. And in 2015, just the same area, it's increased more than 20,000 hectares. This is on others. This is also on pit. This is in Sago Plantation in Kupon uh, <clears throat> Branti in Siak. It's about 2,000, more than 2,000 hectares. 
and I'm also working with the police yeah, for investigation, and we are lucky because the company being penalty for this yeah, is quite big. Uh, in Indonesian money, is about uh, 1.07 trillion you should pay for environmental destruction they made. And then the other point is that when we 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 see, we saw the smokes, the question is what kind of gases is uh, uh, exist there. So uh, in 2015, with our team that support by NASA, we conduct research in Central Kalimantan, then published in 2016 by Stockwell. So from here we recognize about 90 gases. Yeah, and then also what the uh, uh, the uh, the smoke is very uh, also dangerous to the human being. You see here, there is furan and also hydrogen cyanide. The other important one is based on this research, finally we recognize that the IPCC emission factors should be revised because those method make the you know the uh, uh, <clears throat> the emission. Uh, ground has emission in Indonesia is overestimates. From now, here we know the CO is operational 8%, methane is 55%, and it's three is 86%, and CO is uh, uh, much uh, 39%. So it means that you cannot use uh, the, only the model, but you should know the real situation. I think this morning we have uh, a keynote speak, Professor Marco Ren. Uh, he said that the uh, 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 point is that you should know uh, what is burned because sometimes uh, the people don't understand is it fire is pit by us uh, surface found teeth. And the other one, when this is what I said before, when you calculate the image, this is using IPCC. From here, you can see there is uh, two point important point. The one is combustion factor, the, uh, the other one is burn depth. Burn factor, combustion factor is, uh, you know, uh, the equation is depend uh, burns fuels uh, divided to the unburned fuels. So uh, so it's mean the view on the peak, maybe not as one percent, not one, I mean not hundred percent. Because in 100 percent, it's mean that you are working on the dry land, working on peat. I, I mean I, I mean in, in Prata Cylindrica, you cannot put this the one here because why? Because the IPCC put the Conversion factor one, yeah, and also the burn depth. You make some generalization. Uh, later on, this is one another one. Uh, our paper will publish because we cannot make any uh, any uh, generalization because uh, you know uh, the the pit is not like the uh, what football yeah places almost flat. No, this is dumb as uh, uh, etc. So this is yeah. Uh, that of burns, those are different, and combustion also different. You can see here, combustion factor is one. So I'm disagreed, but this one, this one, yeah. So everything looks like managed file, but because in uh, in in reality, it's not like this. Yeah, this is then make uncertainty, and this one, yeah. For instance, like this is reference for instance, like instant factor CO two, CO and methane, yeah, and then. Uh, you cannot choose uh, the lowest. No, if you working on Sumatra, you should use the Bata on Sumatra. You working on Kalimantan, you should use the Kalimantan. I think this is the, the best way. And this is see here, yeah, it, yeah uh, the pitch, uh, pitch set the pot zero point forty one. The other they have their own side, so you cannot mix it. And then this is I would like to say with you. We are talking about a fine pit land. There must be two uh, possibility. There must be round here. This is what we call this uh, surface part on pit, and then this is the pit fire. This is that that yeah we, we would like to discuss because if the fire come here, that means that you eat uh, the fire is it uh, uh, consume this this pit yeah. So the question is how then protect the pit fires? Then we have the regulation and it uh, here yeah this is clear. Sometimes when you calculation you cannot identify which one. The smokes come from this is from surface fire on pit or pit fire because the product is different okay uh, and this yeah uh, i use the the uh, the equipment well yeah uh, this is we are working this is mark uh, we have uh, conduct research in sumatra also in kalimantan yeah? and then this is the show that the uh, how important the in organic uh, soil will increase the, the greenhouse cases 
and decrease water table also, blah, 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 emission carbon dioxide. And finally, uh, the drain increase the vulnerability. And then we got also the reason uh, that the wet soil may reduce the house cases. This is the reason why when we should protect this one. This is the pit and burn and to be like this. So then actually this is the reason why the government try to apply regulation to using the canal blocking, etc. Because we cannot uh, return back the original one to be like this because it burned already. And this produces huge of the uh, what's <clears throat> uh, smoke, again, emission gas, etc. Uh, this is my PhD a student. Uh, they also monitoring about the, the impact of this canal yeah, to the uh, performance of the uh, uh, groundwater level here. And then here, uh, this in this is one good example. And they follow their own, the government regulation. They're lucky because no fire on the side. But the other ones, they don't care and then fire. And this one, yeah, uh, we saw in the film, uh, they said that we, we, we make a blocking canal, but they finally recognize that they're lying. Because uh, if yes, then the situation will not like this. Uh, and the other one, we should also invite the community, not just to uh, blame and uh, uh, taught them not to do this one. No, we should invite them to work together. This, for instance, like community based uh, by management, like in, in West Kalimantan, yeah, this is big money. Finally, they recognize uh, this is very good for them. It is in Siak. Yeah? Also on pit, and then this is in in Mempawa. So uh, uh, Indonesia also working, not working only alone, but they also working with the other like ASEAN, etc. And then also the other activities has been done. Yeah, uh, many activities here. And then finally conclusion because uh, <clears throat> as rise at time. Uh, first pit fire is serious fire. It is very difficult to fight and produce huge amount of greenhouse gas emission and another environmental destruction in Korean flora and power. And then please do not play the game. Greenhouse gas emission reduction only could be reached if and if every sector and human educator working together with clear target and the way to run without any exception as policy only, we recognize is not enough. Fire pressure should be realized as should be applied, not just a jargon. And finally, this is my own uh, suggestion. It is suggested not to use the old IPC because it's be finally something wrong there. But then starting use a new greenhouse calculus based on the scientific data. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very comprehensive and uh, insightful presentation from uh, Professor Bambang. I have noted several key points from uh, Prof. Bambang's presentations, so which are, the first is the tropical forest fire have a vital, sorry, the tropical forest have a vital role in buffering the brunt of global environmental changes. However, extensive fires have become more frequent and pervasive in tropical forests worldwide. And Indonesia has been identified as a hotspot of our fires activities, a considerable proportion of which has come from within its pit landscape. And addressing the problem of forest fire cannot be observed merely from a single pinpoint. It must be seen expansively in various aspects, including focusing on actors that are involved regardless of their impacts in the forest fire cases. Moreover, from a regional perspective in Southeast Asia, it is important to strengthen the existing ASEAN coordinating mechanism to engage all stakeholders, strengthen capacity, and also harmonize relevant programs and projects. Another important point to highlight in regards to the GHG emission reduction, it only could be reached if and if every sector and human individuals working together with a clear target. And also uh, regarding the me measurement of the GHG emission, it is su suggested to start to use a new GHG calculation based on more scientific data rather than relying on the IPCC's uh, old method. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation, uh, Professor Bambang Hero Sahadjo. And uh, now we've come to the time for the third presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce you to the third keynote speaker, Dr. Helena Binti Muhammad Farki from the Department of International and Strategic Studies, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of University Malaya. 
Dr. Helena have several book publications related to the topics such as the forest fire for the sorry the forest for the palms essays on the topics of haze and environment in Southeast Asia and also local and transboundary haze and the haze problem in Southeast Asia palm oil and patronage. Dr. Helena will deliver her presentation, which is titled Haze in Southern Southeast Asia, Regi Regional Effects, Cooperation and Engagement. Again, should you have any question for Dr. Helena, please write it down on the link that has been provided by our committee on the chat box. Please write to whom you, your question is directed to, along with your brief identity. Dr. Helena, you have 20 minutes for your presentation. Uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so uh, RDI will help to uh, manage my slides for me. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for having me here. And it's very nice to see uh, my uh, sort of group members uh, from the Humane uh, group. And I'm very honored to be in the same panel as uh, Pak Bambang, as well as uh, Ibu Lailan. I've met, um, I've had the privilege to meet them before. So I'm very happy to be here again uh, to, to converse with them. Uh, so I will be talking a bit more on the regional perspective. Pak Bamang has given a great um, on-the-ground view. So I will just sort of zoom out a bit and look at it from the regional perspective and also a bit more on the governance perspective. Um, so in my title, uh, if you notice, I've put here Southern Southeast Asia because I think it's important for us to acknowledge that uh, even though we always talk about transboundary haze as a Southeast Asian problem, uh, we have to also realize that there's actually two sort of sub problems in the region and there's a very separate and different problem that is uh, developing in the northern part of Southeast Asia, which is also resulting in haze, resulting in, in, in air pollution, PM 2.5, but the drivers and, and the sort of actors are very different over there. Uh, so for today, we are mainly going to discuss uh, Southern, Southeast Asia, which is our part of the world. Uh, but at the same time, we are also going to discuss about ASEAN and the, and the attempts of, of, of them to manage uh, haze. Uh, and for ASEAN level, they sort of, manage it as a whole, not necessarily as a southern or a northern problem, but I'll go into that um, in a while. So uh, yeah, so now I, 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 I'm, I'm moving on to this slide, sort of discussing uh, the causes and the effects. Uh, something that I also want to mention here is that uh, perhaps in, in Indonesia, the discussion is very much focused on the fires in Indonesia, but actually um, it is not only limited to Indonesia, as you can see, uh, there are also fires um, mostly all over the region and uh, Malaysia, we have fires in Peninsula, we have fires in Sarawak, uh, and we also have fires in Brunei. Um, and even though for, let's say for Malaysia, the causes, the drivers are quite similar with Indonesia, mostly linked to agriculture, whether small scale or large scale. Um, in Brunei, it's quite interesting because it's linked to more of infrastructure. Uh, so when they, when they you know, build roads in, uh, through the peatlands, this has caused fires there as well. And I think this is important to mention because there's a lot of big development activities happening in the region that um, go through peatlands or near peatlands. So for example, in Malaysia, we have our Pan Borneo Highway in Sarawak and Sabah, which cuts through a lot of peatlands. Um, and also I believe in Indonesia, the new development of the, of the new uh, capital is going to be in a, quite a peatland, uh, close to peatlands as well. So we have to consider um, alternative drivers. Uh, so just a, a, a reminder as well to myself as well, to not uh, be too overly focused on the agriculture, but also we have to be um, conscious of these new and developing uh, drivers as well roads, infrastructure, buildings as well that, that, that threaten the, the stability and resilience of our peatlands in our region. So uh, as, as uh, Emmanuel has mentioned, of course, fires can be um, anthropogenic, meaning that it's driven by human activity, caused by human activity, um, which I've mentioned a few examples already. Uh, but there's also, uh, you know, 
in a way, it's also natural in the sense that, you know, it can be uh, triggered or uh, driven by, by dry, um, dry seasons, dry weather, and also um, uh, the severity of haze in the region, the extent of haze in the region um, is very much linked to natural phenomena. So, for example, El Nino. Uh, so, if it's an El Nino year, El Nino comes in cycle. So, if it's an El Nino year, um, the fires may be the same on the ground, but a, a seriously, uh, a serious El Nino year would mean that regionally there will be a bigger regional problem. The haze will spread to a bigger area and the haze will also last longer. Compared to a La Nina year where it's wet, um, the effects on the region will be reduced. So this is how the natural combines with the human to actually produce uh, different aspects and different degrees of seriousness of the transboundary aspect of the haze. So I think I can move on to the next slide, please. So uh, Babang has, and also uh, Emmanuel has also mentioned this slightly, but I would like to just go a bit more detail. Uh, so if you look in the newspapers, if you look back uh, over the years, um, Hayes has, was first mentioned as a transboundary problem in 1983. So that's like four decades already. And um, depending on the severity, it can affect up to eight ASEAN states. Um, and sometimes it's worse, sometimes it's less worse, but usually almost every year you would have some sort of haze in the region. And there have been some studies that have come about trying to evaluate how much damage actually this has caused. So there has been studies in terms of uh, uh, the financial losses and there's also been studies in terms of health losses. So the 2015 haze, which was a very bad uh, year, uh, an especially bad year, um, a few studies have come out of that trying to evaluate how many people have died as a result of this case. So we see some really scary numbers coming out. So there have been studies, one study said an estimated about 40,000 um, people have died as a result of 2015 haze. And another one actually said an even bigger figure, which is 100,000. So we can see that's about the range here. And um, something interesting that we have to note is this does not match um, what the official figures say. Uh, the official figures generally have very low numbers of deaths, and that's because of the way that they count the deaths. So, um, for example, this, they would not only take into account people who died during the haze from haze-induced sicknesses, like um, breathing difficulties and all that, but will also... Uh, take into account people who were already sick and who got sicker because of the haze and then, uh, 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 you know, died or people who would get, who would start to get sick during the haze, but did not die during the haze, but later on. And all of these other gray areas. So this has caused, I mean, this gives a more holistic idea that haze is not only affecting you during the haze season, but you can have all of these prolonged effects as well. So uh, lost man hours, uh, drops in tourism, firefighting costs, additional health costs, all these are the, are the money, the losses, the financial losses that you, that you have. And I think as Emmanuel has mentioned also, when we have the emergencies, you have schools that close, not only in Indonesia, Malaysia as well. So my children couldn't go to school for a few days in Malaysia because of the haze. We have movement restrictions, very similar to what we have now in COVID-19. Um, and uh, basically, uh, you, you cease to have a normal life. Um, the worst affected always, we want to remind ourselves, you know, even me, I'm in Malaysia, I'm currently in Singapore, actually, even though we feel that, oh, it's terrible, but then we always have to remember that our friends in Indonesia are facing much, much more worse situations. We cannot imagine how bad it is right at the epicenter of the fires. Um, and in terms of monetary losses as well, uh, there was a calculation by World Bank that said about 2% of, of Indonesia's GDP was lost in 2015 uh, because of the fires. Next, please. Uh, Pak Bambang has already touched on this, so I won't go into too much detail, but I find that it's very interesting um, the kind of answers that were brought up in the Mentimeter um, so that people... I see that there's still a, a bit of... Um, not uncertainty, but... Um, I guess, yeah, I guess a bit of uncertainty about, about how this actually links to climate change. So I'm sure that Pak Bambang can explain much better than me, but I'm just going to try and explain it um, quite simply. Uh, just 
calling to the attention that peatlands are a very precious resource that we in Southeast Asia have, especially Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, we have huge amounts of peatlands and peatlands are what we call uh, carbon sinks. So there's a lot of peatlands, uh, a lot of carbon that is stored uh, in the ground, uh, in the soil, underneath the water in the peatlands. And Pak Amang has, has, has shown how this can vary across different types of peatlands and different areas. But essentially, um, uh, peatlands are still recognized as a very important carbon sink. Um, and, and this is good because carbon should not be in the atmosphere. It should be you know, kept uh, where, where it is. So this is why carbon sinks are very important. But when you have fires, um, especially the, the land fires, the peatland fires itself, like Pak Bambang mentioned, um, this is when the carbon that were originally stored um, in the soil is released into the atmosphere. So this is when you have uh, a, a huge emissions of carbon uh, and also all the other, uh, other emission uh, gases as well um, into the atmosphere. And this is why, this is what is the link to climate change. Previously, carbon that was stored safely away um, is released uh, through fire. It is, it is accelerated through fire. And this is why you have huge amounts of of, of emissions and this will, will, will make uh, climate change worse. So there was a few years that um, during the big fires, uh, we've had big spikes in, um, in national emissions in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, to show that this is a big contributor. Um, you know, people always say that uh, China and, and, and America, they emit a lot because of their link I mean, because of the industrial emissions, but actually we are having this problem where we have this very natural linked uh, emissions as well. Uh, next, please. Mm -hmm. So I would like to just call your attention to how this has affected um, regional relations uh, across the region. So we always know this sort of age old story where, you know, um, when there is a regional haze, Usually the countries that are affected the worst are Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And um, there's always this sort of back and forth about, you know, what should we do? Who should be responsible? How should we understand this problem? What are the governments doing? And these are just some of the quotes which I've collected over the years from the media, um, just to show what are the types of, um, um, how to say, the types of narrative that comes around, you know, when, we, when, when different governments are trying to respond to the haze in their own way. So we see that because of the nature of the problem, which is cross-boundary, trans-boundary, there's always this conflict of interest. There's always this sort of um, um, blame game happening that, that countries would like to justify their view. They would like to defend their position. And it becomes especially confusing and especially difficult to manage when we look at the drivers. And one of the things that I must acknowledge uh, as a Malaysian is that Malaysia has a very big role to play, not only in the fires in Malaysia, but also um, in the fires in Indonesia as well. So this has always been a bone of contention between Malaysia and Indonesia. And the fact that you know we have a lot of Malaysian um, pulp and paper companies, palm oil companies in Indonesia, and oftentimes they too have been linked to fires. So this has, of, this has of course led to a lot of uh, back and forth. You know, it's your companies, it's, you know, it's not my companies and all this kind of stuff. So this is sort of the underlying tensions uh, linked to the drivers, which are very national based, uh, which has been going on for many years. And this has been since the 1990s, basically. Um, and we can see that there's a lot of, of anxiety uh, when this comes around because it threatens uh, this problem threatens the human um, the, the human security of all of these nations and uh, obviously the country, the governments will respond accordingly in a way that they want to number one defend their position and number two try to do what they can to 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 control it and to uh, attempt to get other countries to be more serious about it as well uh, I I did not name here which country said what maybe you guys can do a bit of a guessing game which might be a bit interesting so next please so a bit on, on the regional engagement next uh, ASEAN has been a very uh, important player in regional engagement over here so you can open up all of the, uh, the, the the boxes here if you just go next 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 all of the 
result. Oh, go back. Oh, no, no. Something's wrong with the with the um, with the thing here. But anyway, um, this is just to show you that over time, ASEAN has been very involved. ASEAN has acknowledged that that uh, transboundary haze is an ASEAN issue and it should be handled at the ASEAN level. So these are all sort of the, the key agreements, key decisions that was taken. And I've stopped at 2003 because 2003 was one of the really important um, agreement on transboundary haze pollution with Pak Bambang has mentioned as well. And this was a, a, a landmark agreement because it was supposed to be a legally binding agreement by ASEAN. And as we know that ASEAN normally does not do legally binding agreements. Uh, but this was the, the one agreement that really pulled all the ASEAN countries together and said, let's do something serious about the haze. Next, please. So this is the agreement that I talked about. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a legally binding agreement. But, you know, um, unfortunately, ASEAN, I, I guess we could say it's a bit to do with, you know, the ASEAN way of how ASEAN generally does things. We depend a lot on consensus, on non-interference, non-legalistic approach. Uh, and because of that, uh, to get everyone's consensus, you, you, you will definitely end up with a document that's a bit weak and watered down without any concrete commitments, um, no enforcement mechanisms or dispute settlement procedures. This has been uh, discussed a lot in the, in the literature, um, the sort of strengths and weaknesses of the, of the agreement. Um, and Indonesia ratified the agreement in 2014, um, which is about uh, 10 years after the agreement was actually, uh, was actually signed. Um, and this was actually the, the year in which everybody got really excited because Indonesia was on board and then all everything in the agreement should could now go forward um, in full force because now everybody was on board um, and the agreement even though i do say that it's weak and watered down there was a lot of content to it that actually brought about a lot of mechanisms that try or or, or that um, that is trying to address haze um, in many levels so for example the national monitoring centers the agreement um, uh, established each country to have a national monitoring center to monitor haze in their country. Uh, the SOP of what to do when there is haze was established for the whole region, so everybody would be on the same page when haze happens. An ASEAN haze fund to collect money to address haze. Um, a panel of experts, and which Pak Bambang is also on the panel, which would be available for consultation. And then also an ASEAN coordination center for transboundary haze pollution control, an actual center that would be established to handle haze from a central location. So this was a this was a very significant thing. Um, the center is not yet established yet; it's still in the process. Currently, the interim functions are being carried out by the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta as well as ASMC. Okay, next. So um, these are also a bit of different perspectives from each country. Uh, so Indonesia is very much interested in trying to use all of its resources to handle the haze uh, internally. Um, they do sometimes receive help from the region. They've accepted help from Singapore, um, Malaysia, and also others uh, from around the world as well. Uh, but sometimes they also do not, they, they turn down the regional assistance because they, they believe that they have things under control. Um, so in Singapore, uh, Singapore has attempted to unilaterally criminalize the haze. They have a Singapore Transboundary Haze Pollution Act, but it has not been very successful, not been very effective because um, nobody has managed to be prosecuted yet. Um, and the, the main difficulty to this was to identify the culprits. So the haze, the, the, their act actually says that anyone or any entity that causes haze in Singapore will be liable under Singaporean law. But it's very, very difficult for Singapore to identify the exact location of where the smoke is coming from that is affecting uh, Singapore. So that's the issue with Singapore. And Malaysia, we're kind of flip-flopping in between. So what this means is Malaysia at one time said that, oh, we also want a similar act like Singapore. Um, but then after that, they sort of went back and said, no, actually, we wanna, we're want to. we not interested in that because Singapore's act, they say, was not very successful. So we should look for another way. But there has been discussion in Malaysia to have a similar bill or a similar act, but the difference is just limited to Malaysian interests, meaning that we're not looking to prosecute just anyone, just only if Malaysian companies are found to be burning or are found to be involved in fire. So Malaysia is taking a, a very sort of taking care of our national um, uh, entities first, you know, making sure that Malaysian companies are behaving themselves. But like I said, this is not in force yet. This is still in discussion stage. And at the moment, it's kind of quieted down. Next, please. 
So currently ASEAN has a roadmap on ASEAN cooperation towards transboundary haze pollution control, and they call it the Haze Free ASEAN by 2020. Um, so uh, as you know, it was, you know, 2019 was a bad haze, um, but not as bad as 2015. Um, but actually before 2019, um, Indonesia was actually quite confident. They said that they, they had things under control. They, they managed it quite well, but unfortunately, 2019, um, in addition with El Nino and all that, there was another haze. Um, but as we know, 2020, we did not really have a regional haze. I think there was still some fires on the ground, but no regional haze because of COVID and also because there was not a bad El Nino year. It was quite a wet year as well. So we're not sure, actually, how it will be next year and the year after, um, when hopefully when uh, the economy comes back, you know, uh, hopefully it will be better at that time, but we're not sure. But um, it looks like we still do have certain problems that we need to sort out. Next, please. So some of the prevailing issues I would like to mention here, which is on my few last few slides. Next. So uh, as Pat Bambang has pointed out, um, peatlands are, are a big issue. We have, to, we have to seriously manage our peatlands properly. Um, so this is actually a percentage for the whole region. Uh, so it's just pointing out that, you know, there's quite a lot of agricultural plantations around peatland. But as Pat Bambang has also pointed out, there are a lot of regulations actually preventing uh, agricultural development, especially intensive agriculture like palm oil and pulp on certain depths and all that. But then um, somehow or other, um, a lot of these plantations are on peatland as well. And um, because of that, uh, it's very hard to manage, you know, water levels. Like Pak Bang said, peatlands are supposed to be wet, not dry. But a lot of these plantations require a certain amount of dryness. Uh, so this is something that we have to look into next. And data sanitization is another important issue as well. Um, if you if you can if you notice, there's actually no standard air pollution index across the countries. So the way that Indonesia counts will be different from the way that Singapore counts and Malaysia counts. So there have been some incidents where in Singapore you would say that the PSI is X number, but in Johor, which is just across the causeway, would have a totally different number. So we don't actually understand. We don't actually have a regional overview of how bad the problem really is. There's also a problem of a meteorological capability variation. So for example, countries like Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, we are quite okay in our, in our meteorological um, capabilities. Thailand is okay as well, but the other Mekong countries, they are not so good. And because of that, um, it's hard to standardize, it's hard to know the exact problem. Okay, next please. And finally, we are still waiting on the establishment of the ACC. Um, I think countries are all very working hard to hope that this can be established very soon. This is one of the elements of the, of the agreement that has not yet been fully established yet. Um, interestingly, um, the, the ACC has been agreed to be in Jakarta. Um, and and, and uh, it's interesting to see the survey that was put earlier, which shows that um, a lot of people have not actually experienced haze. And I believe that might be because a lot of the audience today are from Java, which we don't see the fires. Um, originally, the, the ACC, which is the ASEAN Coordination Center for Haze, was supposed to be in Riau, but for certain reasons, it's agreed to be in Jakarta. So that's going to be an interesting thing. The problem now is that ASEC Environment Division, the ASEAN Secretary of Environment Division, is totally overburdened and they cannot give their full attention to haze. They have handling so many things other than that including climate change. Okay, I think um, that's my final slide. Next, please. Yep, so I'm done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Helena. Your presentation that really adds insight, especially in the uh, ASEAN regional context. There are several key points that we can take from Dr. Helena's presentation, which is uh, about the forest fire, we, which has uh, given several effects, including social, economic, environmental and also even political impacts. Uh, the impact ha had brew initiation in uh, regional cooperation since uh, the timeline of the 1992 uh, and the engagement growth and progress until now with some important moments, including the 2003, uh, the agreement on the transboundary haze pollution. However, uh, each of Asian member states keep maintaining their political interests and progressing toward different direct directions. Nevertheless, there are still prevailing issues such as the management of uh, peatland use and uh, the lack of consensus on data standardization across countries in Asia. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Helena, for uh, your presentation. Now we will move to the discussion session. 
Uh, right now, we have uh, two honorable discussants with us, welcoming uh, Dr. Arif Wijaya from World Resource Institute, Indonesia, and Dr. Uh, Insinyur Lailan Shaufina, MSJ, from Faculty of Forestry, uh, Bogor Agricultural University, APB. First, uh, we will listen to the feedback on uh, the presented topics from our first discussant. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Arif Wijaya from WRE Indonesia that will give insight about the impact of forest fire to climate change more in depth. Dr. Arif Wijaya is forest climate and the ocean senior manager from uh, WRE Indonesia. His uh, work uh, focuses on tropical forest landscape and their impacts on climate change, drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, MRV, RADD plus and national GHG accounting. Dr. Arif, uh, you have 15 minutes for your discussion session. Time is yours. Thank you, Adrian. And um, good afternoon, um, everyone, um, honorable speakers. So I think we've just um, um, heard from three excellent speakers um, providing you know, informations and insights about um, forest fire, um, transboundary haze, um, you know, issues in Indonesia, as we know that um, our country actually, or Indonesia is actually a country that um, frequently um, experiencing the forest fires and peatlands issues. It, it happens uh, back in, 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 in the 80s when I guess um, pretty much of, um, you know, intact forest um, has been there, um, it's, it's, oh, was, was, was still there. So I think I would just try to um, take some important notes uh, from, from the three speakers before I try to make my comments or, or some additions. Um, I, I do agree that um, peatland and forest fires in Indonesia is actually a, a symptom of a weak land use governance. So this is actually the very you know, core issues from, from the um, you know, forest and land fires that is actually happening uh, more intensively um, um, over the past um, two decades or, or three decades. We see how the, um, the forest change trajectory from, 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 from the Western side of Indonesia, from Sumatra to Borneo, and then now actually goes to the Eastern part of Indonesia, the Papua Island, that has still one third of uh, natural impact forests of Indonesia, then if there is no uh, strengthen policies, um, a better regulations, strong leadership, but also commitment, not only from the government, but also from non-state actors, including businesses, this forest will, will be gone soon in the near future, uh, even before uh, 2050. Um, at the same time, um, you know, uh, whenever uh, a drought season came, the El Nino and, and so forth, this will actually trigger um, more forest fires, especially on the pit, because it's very prone to fires once pit length is actually drained. And, and, and we, have, we really have to, you know, pull uh, all of our resources trying, trying to tackle these issues. The first speaker, um, Dr. Emmanuel um, Sacklefest has mentioned that um, what I like from, 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 from the projects that he's actually leading, the human projects, how to involve the community-based um, you know, uh, initiatives uh, on trying the, uh, to, to generate uh, knowledge, but also to involve and participate more actively in mitigating the forest fires. This is actually uh, a similar initiative that also uh, been there. Um, several private companies, uh, um, they have this uh, uh, program called the Forest Fire uh, Programs, but also the National Peatland Restoration Agency that was established back in 2016. They also have this community in involvement, community village to uh, mitigate the forest fires. So I think really uh, one of the speakers mentioned that um, forest fires and peatland fires in Indonesia is actually uh, due to anthropogenic factors. And, and this is really true. Unlike in, in other countries like in Canada or like in the US where actually fires 
also you know triggered or, or mainly triggered because of the the natural cause in Indonesia is because of the conversions of peatlands, and then it triggers you know to do something else to palm oil to pulp and paper companies or for rice plantation it becomes very prone to fires and it actually then trigger more fires and 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 it actually even you know um, spread to the to, to, to the areas where um, the good forest, the intact forest are still exists. Um, Professor Bambang um, and the second speakers actually mentioned about, you know, um, how the, um, this, the severity of, of the forest fires uh, in, in the last two decades, especially in, in the, the 2015, where um, the toxic haze actually goes to neighboring countries. Um, I, I could uh, again highlight here um, also, the third speakers uh, already mentioned that in 2015, of about 16 billion US dollars of total economic loss actually, um, you know, caused uh, by the forest fires in Indonesia. This is based on the World Bank study. And, and on, the, uh, on the top of that, another study mentioned that uh, 100,000 of people actually uh, facing uh, a risk of premature death in the future because of the uh, intensified forest fires and half million of people, not only in Indonesia, but also in Singapore, Malaysia, and in Southeast Asian countries, they are seeking for uh, medical assistance because of this um, severe forest fire back in 2015. And, and I think uh, Professor Bambang mentioned also how the algorithm is actually uh, is, is, is crucial to, uh, to come up with the, the accurate estimates of forest fire emissions. Um, based on my scientific experience, in the first year, uh, when we actually analyzed 20 years of the land cover change in Indonesia, the emissions from forestry and land use sectors could actually contribute to 50% of the forestry and land use emission in the bad year when actually El Niño came like 2015, like the year of uh, uh, 1984 or in 1997 or 98, which is actually which was actually very prominent because of the forest fires and then the transitions in the government and so forth. Um, Dr. Helena, the last speakers, um, made a very um, strong point um, and also very important on the um, corporations in Southeast Asia. The ASEAN uh, Transboundary Haze Agreement is actually key. Indonesia is indeed um, the last country in ASEAN that signed the, the agreement because of, you know, there are a lot of sticking points there, of course, for Indonesia that actually, you know, um, um, highly responsible for the, for the uh, you know, transboundary haze uh, in, in the region. So it, it took them, you know, uh, a long process to finally ratify this agreement. But again, I also would like to uh, um, highlight that Indonesia has, has actually committed um, to reduce emissions uh, by 2030. Uh, from 29% to 41% with international supports. Out of uh, 29%, out of 50% of these emissions um, reductions target will come actually from um, forest and 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 and, and uh, forestry and and land use sectors. And if a forest fires keeps happening in the future, this will certainly uh, compromise uh, it, the government target to achieve their emissions reductions. That's one. What I would like to highlight a little bit coming up, you know, um, all of the uh, presentations, this, this excellence insight from, from the three speakers. Couple of points here. One, um, I think uh, after the 2015 forest and peatland fires, the government established the National Pitland Restoration Agencies that was responsible to restore up to 2 million hectares of peatlands uh, over seven priority provinces in Indonesia. This has actually been an important milestone whereby there is one, um, you know, dedicated uh, government agency that has responsibility to restore the forest fire. The second, the strengthened law enforcement. This is also very important. The government has been involving police, local police army, and then so forth to 
mitigate the fires. And the third is actually on the social forestry aspect, providing more authority to local community to manage their own land, improving their sense of ownership, the ownership um, to the land actually uh, improve um, the efforts to mitigate forest fires. And the last is the moratorium policies, primary forest and peatland uh, moratorium policies, and also oil pump uh, moratorium policy actually also lead to reduce forest fires. On the top of, of course, uh, a friendly, um, you know, weather. Uh, last year there was, and also 2019 was actually relatively wet year, but I think these are um, some additional from my side on the top of what um, the speakers has uh, conveyed uh, before. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your feedback, uh, Dr. Arif. Indeed, it is a very interesting discussion. Uh, Dr. Arif um, previously mentions that uh, there are some importances on of provide of providing the important resources in uh, mitigating uh, forest fires, including um, in engaging uh, with the local communities uh, and also uh, uh, engaging uh, the local actors that are also involved uh, within uh, uh, the management of the forest fire. And also the presenters and the discussants agree that uh, forest fires happen because of anthropogenic activities, that is hazards caused by human actions. Also, uh, Dr. Erf previously mentioned that, that, that we need to focus on, including uh, the importance on uh, strengthening the law enforcement uh, and also Regarding to the uh, land ownership, uh, there is uh, importance of the increasing the sense of the ownership on the land, on the land. and also regarding to the policy uh, on the importance of the moratorium or on the uh, certain aspect of the policy, including the forest fire policy. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arif, for a uh, very insightful and very uh, interesting uh, discussion. Um, for, and the second, we will listen to the feedback uh, from our second discussant. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Insignor Lailan Shalvina, MSJ. She is Associate Professor in the Department of Celtic Culture, Faculty of Forestry, Bogor Agricultural University, IPB, who has expertise in forest fire and forest protection. Dr. Insignor Lailan previously published uh, some papers re related to the topic, such as a uh, new estimate of, of particulate emissions uh, from Indonesian pit fire in 2015, that published in 2019. And then a uh, forest and land fires uh, are mainly associated with deforestation in Leo province, Indonesia in 2020, and uh, forest and land fires in Indonesia assessment and mitigation in 2000, 2018, among others. Uh, Dr. Uh, Insignor Lailan Shalvina, uh, you have uh, 15 minutes for uh, your discussion session and time is yours. Thank you, Pak Adrian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the RDI for giving me the opportunity uh, to be a discussion in this uh, important webinar. It is an honor for me to be here with you all. I hope uh, all the participants still have um, are still excited to to know more about uh, fire and pitland. Yes, uh, I think all the excellent speakers uh, agree that uh, there is a strong correlation uh, between pitland and fire. It's just like uh, sides of a coin cannot be separated. Uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting to be discussed. And uh, from all the speakers also agree that the key for the fire prevention or to uh, a solution for transboundary haze pollution is uh, sustainable pipeline management. That's, uh, I put a title of my talk here uh, about the sustainable pipeline management as a solution for transboundary haze pollution. Uh, from 
point of view of a case of Indonesia. Next, please. Yes, in this um, uh, presentation, uh, I would like to uh, discuss about the fire and pit land and also the uh, changing of paradigm of uh, Indonesian government in fire uh, management and also some technology and uh, social approach uh, have been conducted by uh, Indonesian government and uh, sustainable uh, pit land management. Next, please. Yes, uh, as uh, Dr. Helena said that actually uh, in our region, fire has been uh, appeared, yeah, has been uh, occurred uh, since the last four decades, especially the uh, large fires ever recorded in our region in the uh, last four decades, uh, starting from uh, 1983, 1982 and 1983, and until 2019. And all these large fires uh, is, uh, uh, are associated with um, um, El Nino phenomenon. So uh, this El Nino phenomenon is very important uh, factors influencing the fire occurrence in our region. Next, please. Yes, uh, I... Uh, don't want to elaborate more in this uh, matters because Prof Bambang and also Dr. Emmanuel and also Dr. Helena has uh, have already uh, described uh, these impacts very clearly for us. Uh, the huge impacts of um, fire, especially the pitland fires. Uh, that 90 percent of the transboundary haze pollution produced by pitland fires. That's why the pitland management is very important uh, to prevent the fires. Next, please. Yes, we also agreed that uh, our speakers mentioned that uh, the cause, the main cause of the fires uh, is the human being, especially for pitland fires, 100 percent of the fire caused by uh, human factors, especially the land clearing activities uh, using fire as the cheapest and the easiest way for uh, people. Next, please. And uh, this graph also showed us um, information from the Global Fire Emission Database that Indonesian fires in 2015 has contributed to almost 2 billion tons of greenhouse gas emission as uh, mentioned uh, clearly and in detail by Prof Bambang also. Uh, and also uh, the other graph, the right graph, show us the uh, pit fire uh, combustion in Indonesia contributed to 45% of uh, particulate matter emission. This is uh, the research result from our collaboration, uh, IPB and Leeds University uh, in uh, calculating or estimating the uh, emission from pitland fires. And uh, the greater contributions is of 68% uh, in 2015 fire, of course, affected human health. Next, please. Uh, Dr. Helena also has described uh, how a uh, big function of the pitland area. And uh, we all know that uh, Indonesia has the largest pitland in the region. Uh, it is about 14.9 million hectares and about 8% of the total land area distribution. Uh, and this uh, pitlands distributed in three big islands, uh, Sumatra, Kalimantan, and Papua. And uh, it ranks fourth of the largest pitland uh, in the world after Canada, Russia, and USA. And as the largest tropical pitland uh, uh, we have in Indonesia, which have uh, very important functions, uh, including the hydrological balance, carbon stock, uh, and sequestration, of course, biodiversity conservation, 
livelihood and ecotourism. Next, please. From this graph, we can see uh, there is an interesting trend of forest uh, and land fire occurrence in Indonesia uh, since the last uh, five years from 2015 to 2020, uh, that there is a decreasing trend of uh, forest and land fires occurrences uh, based on the data from Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Now the ministry also uh, use a satellite imagery process to estimate the uh, burn area. And uh, of course, in this graph also, we can see the highest uh, burn area occurred in uh, 2015 and also in 2019, and it is uh, related to the El Nino phenomenon. And it, it is the interesting uh, trend, of course. And why is that so? So please, uh, next, next slide. Yes, after having a large fire occurrence and devastated impacts in 2015, uh, starting from 2016 until now, the government of Indonesia has uh, shifted uh, his, uh, their paradigms into the new paradigm uh, in addressing land and forest fires, uh, which is more focused on fire prevention. Before 2015, the uh, government policy is not so focused on fire prevention, but after uh, the big uh, large fire occurrence in 2015 uh, has been uh, a shifted paradigm to be more focused on fire prevention. And we can see here the cycle of forest and land fire management in Indonesia. Uh, from January to December, they have already a strategy to uh, prevent the fires. That's uh, perhaps why uh, there is a decreasing trend of uh, forest and land fires uh, occurrence uh, within the last uh, five years. Next, please. Yes, uh, this is um, uh, some technological and uh, later I will also uh, explain about the social approach in uh, forest fire management in Indonesia. Uh, perhaps is also uh, uh, answer uh, the question or the um, statement of Dr. Helena when uh, she mentioned about the SMC, why the SMC is not uh, functioning uh, optimally to all the region. Uh, as uh, I agree with you that all of uh, the countries, all of the member states of ASEAN has their own uh, capacity and technology uh, being developed uh, to uh, control or to manage uh, their forest and land fire. Such as in Indonesia, uh, for uh, early warning system, we have national fire danger rating system called uh, Spartan managed by uh, BMKG, the National Agency for Meteorology climatology and geophysics. It is very uh, developed uh, system, and this system developed based on uh, Canadian fire danger rating system. And uh, previously it was supported also by Canadian uh, government. Uh, in this uh, uh, fire early warning system, uh, include also pit moisture content in drought code uh, formula and also uh, we have also water level monitoring system uh, for pitland as an indicator for fire as mentioned by Prof. Bambang that uh, one of the indicator for uh, fire uh, is the uh, pit moisture content. It is the uh, significant or important uh, indicator for pitland fire. So uh, here we have a system uh, for monitoring uh, water level uh, managed by uh, BRGM now, yeah, Pitland and uh, Mangrove Restoration Agency. Next, please. 
And uh, we have also a fire information system or Sipongi managed by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, uh, where we can find uh, the burn area data and also the hotspot as the indicator, uh, the hotspot uh, as indicator of uh, forest and empires also derived from LAPAN. LAPAN is the National Agency for Aer Aeronautics and Space. Now we have only one uh, data source uh, of hotspot. Before we have many uh, uh, data source of hotspot. Now uh, Indonesia has uh, only one data hotspot uh, from LAPAN. Next, please. And the Ministry of Environment and Forestry has also used uh, fire monitoring using uh, thermal CCTV uh, and also drone for the early de fire detection. So actually, um, uh, within uh, the last two decades, uh, the government of Indonesia has uh, developed uh, some technologies uh, to uh, control the fire. Uh, like uh, which I uh, explained previously. Next, please. And uh, the other technology for pitland monitoring uh, is uh, using IoT. This is the example of collaboration, yeah, regional collaboration uh, in research uh, among uh, IPB, uh, UPM, uh, MIMOS from Malaysia, and also University Technology Brunei and also BPPT from Indonesia. Uh, we have a research uh, on the uh, pitland monitoring system using uh, IoT. Next, please. And this is the agroforestry system. I think with this, we can uh, uh, involve the community. Next, please. And this uh, other social approach uh, for supporting the community in zero burning land preparation, some technologies also have been developed. Next, please. Yes, I think all, this, the, all the speakers uh, mentioned uh, the importance of uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, partnership, the collaboration, yeah, because uh, uh, a result of a review of the APMS, ASEAN Pitland Management Strategy, uh, implementation in Indonesia has identified some strength of uh, Indonesia government in pitland management, including the policies and uh, pitland mapping, community involvement, and uh, information system, incentive, restoration, and uh, many others. And therefore, uh, future strategy, we need uh, inventory of, of pitland hydrological unit, fire prevention, of course, partnership is very important uh, key for sustainable pitland management. And of course, regional collaboration and exchange of good practices is very important. I think all of the speakers also mentioned about this. Next, please. Yes, uh, this is the uh, multi stakeholder partnership of forest and land fires uh, because uh, fires or pitland itself cannot be managed by uh, one single institution, but need to be approached by uh, multi stakeholders, including government, uh, academician, uh, private sectors, community, and also GSO or NGOs. Next, please. Yes, as the closing remarks, uh, uh, I can say that uh, despite of the importance of uh, pitland uh, area in Indonesia, we all the speaker also mentioned that uh, pitland fires is uh, one of the most serious issue on uh, pitland management. And for Indonesia case, the government has changed paradigm in forest and land fire uh, control by focusing on uh, fire prevention. And uh, there are some technology and also social approach uh, has be, have been developed in controlling the fire. And of course, the last one is the multi-stakeholder approach is the key for sustainable pitland management in our region. With this, uh, I would like to end my uh, comments for all the speakers. Thank you for the excellent 
uh, presentation and sharing uh, with us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Dr. Lailan for a very interesting and insightful presentation. Uh, especially for bringing uh, first the historical aspects of uh, Indonesian forest fires that is also linked to the previous presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Helena. And also um, Dr. Lailan mentions on uh, the importance of uh, bringing the importance of, of peatland management as part of forest fire prevention through the fact that uh, peatland fire contributes much to the GHG emission based on the time series data with the pivot moments in uh, 2015. And also, moreover, we also need to consider that Indonesia has the largest uh, tropical peatland area in the world. Another important point uh, from uh, Dr. Leilan, uh, she mentions that uh, technological, agricultural, and social approaches are important in uh, the management of uh, peatland. Uh, for the technological approaches, uh, Dr. Lailan uh, mentioned about uh, the optimization of early warning system for forest fire and also uh, water monitoring system, uh, fire information, and also early detection system. Meanwhile, for agriculture approach, including a more sustainable way of agriculture and social approach, including the involvement of communities. And uh, there is also a uh, very important point that the multi-stakeholder multi approaches are uh, also important to uh, gather all of the actors uh, from the uh, research uh, institutes or universities and also from the private sector and from the community and also from the government uh, together to uh, build the sustainable pitland management system. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leyland, for uh, your uh, very insightful presentation. What a great discussion we had here between our keynote speakers and discussants. I'm sure that all the key points from the discussion are very insightful for all of us today and increase our understanding about forest fires and its management, especially in Indonesia. Okay, now that we have heard the feedback from our honorable discussants, it is the time for question from uh, the participants of uh, this webinar. We have collected all of the questions, uh, but due to the limitation, we will only read uh, some of the questions uh, from uh, the list of questions. So uh, first we have a question from uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, the question is from Afif uh, from University of Indonesia. Uh, his question is, uh, it is such a nice idea about community perception on the haze pollution due to the forest fire. Which community should we involve in the transboundary haze pollution management? Since the affected community is large and widely various across areas with different backgrounds. I hope the question is clear, uh, Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, and you may uh, try to answer the question. Thanks. Yes, it's, it's very clear. And it's a very good question. Um, like you realize that um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to give a very short answer. But uh, should um, Afif want more information, I'm, I'm happy to have a further discussion post um, the event. Um, I think the important thing is to notice that uh, to note that with core design, you have a different mindset. Rather than having things happening or dictated to communities, actually, you involve them to be part of. Um, I agree that um, actually global challenges, they start first locally and every diff every area will be very different. So, you know, there isn't one uh, size uh, um, approach uh, to that. Uh, it will differ depending on the area and the context where you're working. Um, but I would be personally starting with, uh, first of all, forest dependent communities. So the ones that they have the most to make, the most to lose. And, you know, they, they, they live very close to the forest or in the forest. They're the ones that are engaging um, or they have things happening to them. And then I would gradually be expanding that to include all the other communities, because the main thing is to make this as inclusive as, as possible, rather than seeing, um, you know, that the focus is only on a single community or a single actor. 
Um, so the, the approach will, be, will vary you know, depending on the area. Um, and that's why I mentioned that we need, first of all, to understand the intersectoral uh, challenges um, to be able to, to address this. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, for uh, the answer. Maybe we can uh, move to the next question. Uh, we have another question for uh, Professor Dr. Bambang Herosarju. Uh, the question is from Jason from NUS, Singapore. Uh, the question is, thank you for the presentation, Prof. Bambang. As you explain about how pit fires are a serious problem right now, what is the best alternative to manage pit fire prevention? Should we, the community, be more adapted with the frequent pit fire? I hope the question is clear, uh, uh, Bambang. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I try to answer the question. So, yeah, uh, I think one of the best solution is the uh, sustainable pit management. You know, there is uh, <clears throat> regulation there. And uh, like I said before, you would like to manage your uh, eat and you will produce more and more and then uh, there will no more uh, you know, negative impact. Then the problem is you should support and give a big you know, uh, challenge to the people and also to the uh, uh, local governments, uh, even to the central government on how you manage your uh, your pit there, because uh, the solution is uh, there. Even though you have uh, you know excellent everything, even you have the excellent monitoring. For instance, like we have experience now in several places, you have already detected the pit fires there. So the problem is who will fight, who will solve the problems? Because uh, sometimes you know when the fire there and smoke already, the people don't want to to involve them there. So, so uh, uh, again and again, uh, you should work together. For instance, like you have found something, then you uh, you tell them, or you we, you anywhere your group, yeah, like uh, NGO, everybody, because I close also with them. Yeah, I work together to fight this. I keep your uh, pit look like it original, like it's a uh, ecosystem, like uh, because uh, again and again, pit is the wetland should uh, you know uh, wet or at least you know uh, the, the surface is uh, quite wet and uh, protect it from the fires uh, because sometimes you know uh, sometimes the people don't want because uh, they said that oh there is my, not my job this is government job so when the problem occurred hey guys <laughs> you will affect it you will tell that they know this is your your problems now so this is the reason why uh, I said before in, in my conclusion, you cannot uh, blame the government. The government will try, especially in Indonesia, we have 7,000 uh, uh, islands and we have also 14 million people and also with uh, different characteristics of the people on the ground. Uh, the uh, part of the people really care and the people don't care. So this is the situation, you see, and then again and again, strengthen the collaboration is one of the solution and keep your pit is uh, wet. I think that is the solution. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Bambang, uh, for the answer. And maybe we can go next to the next question. Uh, we have two questions actually for uh, Dr. Helena. And uh, actually this question is, uh, the two question is connected to each other. The first question is from uh, Dila from Unpar, uh, Bandung. Uh, the question is, how should we deal with the, with or mitigate ASEAN's intergovernmental principle uh, or the ASEAN way and unilateralism because it might prevent stronger real regional coordination or cooperation in managing transboundary haze pollution. And the second uh, question is from Iksan from ADI. Uh, Bandung, uh, which is uh, considering that the ASEAN way may not solve the issue of contradicting interest between ASEAN member states. In your perspective, how can the ASEAN Secretariat 
bolster the commitment of all ASEAN member states to tackle these issues. Uh, are the current resources available uh, key to this? For example, by allocating more resources into uh, capacity building, technological sharing, or awareness raising for each uh, uh, ASEAN member states. Um, that's, uh, is, that's, these are the questions for uh, Dr. Helena, and uh, you may try to answer, Dr. Helena. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely the um, this ASEAN way has been uh, 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 quite a, a big problem like, in, in, in managing haze because it kind of um, leaves the decision making not at the ASEAN level but at the region at, at the country level. So it, it really very much depends on how much the country is interested to respond. So I think one of the things that is um, an opportunity now is the interest for the individual countries in terms of climate change. There's a lot of initiative from Malaysia, from Indonesia, positive things like uh, Pa Arif has talked about, uh, commitments from these countries. So I think uh, linking haze to climate change is a very big uh, opportunity because not many people, as we have, we have seen in our Spentimeter, actually realize the link between haze and climate change. So I think once uh, this becomes more obvious and um, this can be the incentive for the countries as well as the ASEAN level to act on haze uh, or rather to prevent haze as an opportunity for us to also contribute at the global level to this global problem. And I think um, this can also possibly attract international funding as well. We know that there is limited funding available in the region. So uh, when we shape it or when we propose it as a region, as a global uh, climate change problem, as compared to a regional localized problem, um, it may open up new sources of funding. Um, so I think this is an opportunity that we can take. Um, so I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Helena, for your uh, uh, very nice answer. And um, thank you. Uh, to all of the uh, presenters and discussant for uh, giving such a very interesting discussion and also presentation and also a clear and comprehensive answer to the questions from our participants. And maybe for the next, uh, we are heading to the closing session uh, for uh, today's webinar. And we have heard uh, the comprehensive and insightful presentation from our honorable uh, keynote speakers from Dr. Emmanuel, from Professor Dr. Bambang Hero Saharjo, and uh, from Dr. Helena Binti Mamafaki. And we have also heard a very nice discussion session with our uh, honorable discussant, uh, Dr. Arif Vijaya, and also Dr. Insinyur Lailan Shofina, MSG. And uh, from our uh, today's uh, webinar, we can uh, learn a lot of things from uh, the importance of the peatland management in forest fire prevention, and also the importance of uh, engaging with the community, local community, but also considering the local actors uh, that are also involved, uh, regardless their uh, contribution uh, to the impact of the forest fires. And also, uh, there is also uh, the importance of focusing also on the uh, technological aspects uh, social aspects and also agricultural aspects because these aspects are also uh, very interrelated to the peatland uh, management uh, in Indonesia. And uh, maybe uh, for uh, today's uh, webinar, uh, we can uh, con uh, conclude our webinar now. And I would like to express uh, high, our, our, my highest, our highest added gratitude to uh, first to Dr. Emmanuel Cheklefes, and also uh, second to uh, Professor Don Dr. Bambang Heru Saharjo, and uh, to Dr. Helena Binti Muhammad Farki, and also uh, to Dr. Arif Vijaya and Dr. Insinyur Lailan Shofina for willing to join us today in this webinar and share such insightful knowledge to all of us on the topic of forest fire management. I hope all the key takeaways from every presentation and discussion can inspire us and uh, are useful uh, in understanding uh, better about uh, forest fire in, and its management. And I also want to like to uh, give appreciation to all of the invitees, uh, first uh, from delegates from the Global Environment Center or GEC, 
and second uh, to Center for International Forestry Research, C4, and uh, to uh, Ministry of Agrarian Affairs and Spatial Planning, ATR BPN, and Meteorological Climat Climat Climatological and Geophysical Agency, BMKG. And uh, participants of, uh, and lastly, uh, from uh, Ministry of Environmental and uh, Forestry, KLHK. And participants uh, of this webinar, thank you for your enthusiasm in joining us today. Also for all of the questions that you have given. Lastly, uh, we can take a picture for documentation. So everyone, please kindly open your cameras so we can uh, take the picture together. Maybe a team from RDI can uh, give a direction for the uh, taking photo. Uh, okay, Kasunggo, uh, I will give a direction. Uh, so uh, please, for everyone here, open your camera. Okay. Okay, uh, actually there will be two slides, so maybe just be ready and I will take, uh, I will take this screenshot. Okay, uh, the first one, uh, that's one, two, three. Uh, okay, nice, uh, one more, uh, okay, one more. Uh, one, uh, wait, okay. One, two, three. All right, uh, all right, guys, it's done. Thank you, Kasongko. Thank you, Maria, for a very nice uh, direction. And also, thank you so much once again to everyone and see you on the next occasion. And uh, this uh, webinar will also be posted in uh, RDI's YouTube channel later. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for okay. the speakers. Okay, thank you.